So we have already seen lots of discrete logarithm attacks and of course all of them apply also to finite fields. So we have seen what is called generic attack. So a generic attack means it doesn't care what group it is in, it works anywhere. And the ones we have seen are, well, the square root attacks. So we have baby step, giant step, but that's a square root attack which requires storage. And then we have seen the followed row method in, well, single threaded and parallel version. And that is also running in scroll of the group order size, uh, group size uh, time, and can be efficiently paralyzed. It does not require storage. Okay, so those attacks, of course, also apply for the finite field discrete block. Also, the Polish Hellman does, and well, it's going to be on the homeworks as well. So you're definitely going to look through this again. But finite fields have some extra attacks, and in this calculus, what this topic, which is the topic of this lecture is one of these attacks that only works for finite fields. Or I mean, it works when there's a certain structure in place which we have for finite fields and we don't have for elliptic curves, for instance. Okay, so the idea behind this is, taking a step back here, is we we're given the discrete log problem, so we're knowing a base element g, and we know that h is some power of g. So I'm writing it here multiply because, well, that's the finite field discrete log we're in. And you want to know what is the logarithm of h base g. And then the idea is that somehow we're able to solve a lot of discrete logs, well, with some linear relations. And I'm going to show you why this is actually a realistic assumption. But now let's assume that we're getting all of those. So assume that we know a whole bunch of small discrete logs. And actually, I'm going to focus only on the discrete logs of primes. So for integer primes, which are small, pi's are, say, 2, 3, 5, 7, etc., those are small primes. And let's assume that for each of them, we know what power of g goes in to get this pi. So let's call the log base g of pi, let's call that ai. Um, I'm brushing a bunch of details under the carpet here. Um, of course, we have seen the poly hellman attack and therefore know that we shouldn't work in the whole big fine field, we should work in a subgroup of it. Um, the attack doesn't really care about it. Um, it works for the big group in the same time as it works in the small group, and we have to do a little bit of more gymnastics in order to get the small group to work, so let's assume for the moment that G generates the whole group. So each of the primes, the small primes, um, is an element of that group and therefore this discrete log is defined. If G only generates a subgroup, then well, you are more selective with your primes, you're going for small primes that also are um, in the subgroup generated by G. Okay, so under the assumption we have all of those, and another assumption, let's assume that H, our target, can be written as a product over small primes. Well, h taken as an integer less than p certainly has some presentation where, well, it's a product over primes to the ei, so it's just using the factorization, which we have of the integers. But we also would like to have that all the discrete logs are known for these pi's. So these pi's that appear in the factorization of h are those in the previous item where we know the discrete logs. So if we're in this happy case, then I can replace h by this representation as the powers of p, as a product of a powers of pi. And then the logarithm, well, the discrete log works the same as other logarithms if you're having the logarithm of an exponentiation. Well, the exponent comes at the front, and if you have the logarithm of a product, it's a sum of the logarithms. So the logarithm of this product here, of what h is, is the same as the sum over these exponents of the pi times the logs of the pi. Well, and then here is where we need that the logs of these pi are known, so we can replace the log of pi base g with this ai. Okay, well, if we now would happen to know, well, we're getting the ei from the factorization, and if we happen to know all these ai, we've just solved the discrete log problem. Of course, there are a bunch of ifs. There's the if that we know these discrete logs, so we need to well, get into the situation where that's the case. And there's also the if that h factors in a way that only involves these pi's. Now, we've seen this already in the uh, number field sieve, from the algorithms leading up to it, uh, for factoring numbers, that 
well, we always do some choices and then hope that the number is smooth. So we pick some bound and then we hope that the number factors into prime powers where each prime is less than this bound. And if not, we have to do something else. So, I mean, unless we're choosing very, very large primes, um, this will not always work. But it's easy to bootstrap from that. We can use this uh, Senumura self-randomization that I have talked about in a different context to change h into some other discrete log, into having some other discrete log where we also, well, if we can solve that one, we can recover the discrete log of h. So let's pick a random exponent k, and then, well, for that random exponent, compute g to the k times h, and then look whether that factors. And, okay, so taking a random k, computing g to the k times h, that sends us around in the integers pretty nicely. So this is similar to sampling a random integer between uh, z, uh, 1 and p minus 1. And so eventually this will work. Of course it depends on the size of your factor base, on the size of these primes, how long it will take, how many attempts you need to do till you find such a k, but at least we can see how to make progress. So the second stage, yeah, we, we see how this can work. And then the first one, that's a bit more mysterious. Um, but if we get this to work, then we have that the logarithm on the right hand side of this, g to the kh, well that's k plus the logarithm of h, um, that's the part that you want to know, the k we have just plugged in, so we know that, is the sum over this ei ai, well that's the factorization, and then in order to get the log we just move the k over to the other side. Okay, so when we talk about um, index calculus attacks on discrete logs, we're working about two stages. There's this first stage which collects these relations to get these AI. So after the first stage, we have enough information to basically know the discrete logs of all the primes. And we can make the stage one in a way that is independent of the target. So we don't even need to know what the target is yet. So we can just set this up and then lean back and wait till someday somebody comes who we actually want to break. And then, well, we only have to do stage two where we're doing a few random choices of k in order to recover the discrete log. And so if you're in the scenario that you maybe even want to do many, many targets, you might be willing to invest more effort into stage one than you would be if it's a single shot. And so um, a paper called LogGem, well, which is at weekdh, they actually uh, optimized this for something which would be like a nation state attack. I think of the NSA sitting there and wanted to break basically everybody on the internet so they have enough targets and since by coincidence people tend to use the same groups and tend to use two small groups they could actually set up the stage one and then get quite a discount for each stage two or two. Now this what I'm going to show you here is basically the school book version there's a lot of difference between what I can show you and what you would be doing if you're the NSA, or even if you're just researchers imitating the NSA. Um, but there are always these two stages, but they differ in many of the details. So it's not actually correct that in a real attack, you would do stage one all the way to getting the AI. In my application, yes, we will see all the um, individual discrete logs. And well, similar to how I showed you Dixon's, method of equivalence of squares in detail and then moved up through the Q-sif to the number field sif each time doing more, more hand waviness, there are similar levels of optimization going in. So there's a lot of work if you really want to do this, but it's important for you to understand kind of the general structure of these algorithms. Also, if somebody says, oh, but this is so large, well, maybe they can break five keys, but they can't break one more because then you're missing that you can actually do this in stages and getting quite a discount for stage two. All right, so let's jump into what stage one does. I already announced that we need to, fact, um, need to kind of fix a factor base, so we're picking primes that are less than some power E. And that's just our normal factor base, and again, similar to what I had on the slides for Dixon's method, we're gonna collect a bunch of relations, so it's gonna be, again, a matrix which has um, f columns, so for each prime we'll have a column. Actually this time it's going to be an inhomogeneous system. 
So it's going to be f plus 1 columns. And so we need somewhat more relations than we have columns in the matrix because we might get uh, linear dependencies between those. I mean, as in kind of duplicates. And then the stereotypical way is working pretty much the same as we just randomized this age, except for now it works without an age. So we're just picking a j, we're computing g to the j as an fp element. So we're using the reduction mod p there. But then we take the result as an integer. So let's call this result b, and let's insist that this result is between 0 and p minus 1. If you prefer, you can also make it minus p minus 1 over 2 till plus p minus 1 over 2 and deal with the sign bit. But you need to have some unique representation as an integer. In this unique representation, you then have to factor it. And then you check whether you can factor b over this factor base. So now we have restricted your primes, so it doesn't work for all b's. But if you get a b for which um, the whole right hand side, I mean, that no other primes appear, well, b was d to the j. So we know what the discrete log is of this relationship. So we know that j, ah, so j is the sum over the ei's log pi, just because, well, this product here is the same as g to the j. So if you're looking at the exponents of g, well, on the right hand side, uh, on the left hand side, it's j, and on the right hand side, it's the ei's multiple of the log of pi. Okay, so this gives us one relation. So that's why I said it's an inhomogeneous system. It gives us in the variables log base g of pi. So those are the variables we want to find out. Um, it gives us a relationship with these ei's and the sum is equal to j. Okay, so after we have collected enough relations, we will try to solve this matrix. This step is a bit harder than it was for the RSA attacks because well, in this case, we can't argue that we're looking for squares or something. This is actually a system of equation that works modulo the order of g. And that order can be pretty large. I mean, we're working with cryptographic orders. Um, and so this has to be at least um, working with the square root sizes, that, I mean, protect against square root attacks. So you're having at least 256 bits. And typically, you're looking at much, much larger systems. Again, you can do a lot of tricks. You can do... Uh, Chinese remainder theorem ideas and so on, but in the end it is computing linear algebra on the system modulo the proof order. And afterwards, well, if this succeeded, you're outputting uh, the AI being the log base G of PI. If it didn't work, meaning the system is underdetermined, you go back and collect a few more relations. So that's the first stage. So in the schoolbook version, after the end of the first stage, you have all the little discrete logs. So you know for each small pi, for every pi, which is the factor base, you know what the discrete log of it is. So we have now gotten the assumption to work. And it's interesting to kind of abstract what is happening here. So the reason that we can turn this into an algebra is that we have this duality of working in fp, so integers modulo p, and then looking at the integers without reduction and they're using unique factorization. So we're basically using an extra structure. We're going from fp to the integers using structure there that is compatible with the, well, the discrete log here is a discrete log there. I mean, like, if there's no reduction, that's correct. And then we can use linear algebra in order to collect these relations, uh, to combine these relations. Each row is correct, and so, well, Every vector that satisfies this will also be a solution. And so eventually we're getting this AI. Now the second stage I already had on the, on the overview slide. So this is really taking the target, is picking my name, is k. We try and try and try again until we get a case where d to the k times h factors. If it does, we're done. Well, okay. We have to compute the factorization um, and then not mess us up in writing down this formula. So this formula is, again, model group order. We have gotten an extra k, so we have to subtract it. And this is the right-hand side one over there. So the optimization um, 
a lot of it goes into what I, what is stage one. So similar to what you've seen in um, in this sorry in, in this method, and then leading to the sieving steps, is also applicable here. So we don't actually want to pick random j's and then hope they factor as random j's and then hope that the g to the j factors. We want to do something so that we have control over the algebraic relations between those, so we can actually use some sieving approaches again. We don't want to go for each of those as one short thing and then factor, but we want to have a whole bunch of them collected, uh, generated once, and then compute on all of them using these sieving ideas. It goes a bit further. So all the ideas I showed you for the number field sieve for factoring, um, most of those have analogs also on the index calculus world. And so again, we're working with number fields and we're working with sieving, and so also the best attack the best in this helpless type attack uh, on FP is called the number fields. So when somebody tells you number fields, if you have to ask is it for factoring or is it for index calculus or for computing discrete logs. And the asymptotic cost looks pretty much similar to what you have seen for the number fields if for factoring, except for there are some small differences in the cons. So here I didn't write it out, um, but it's the same shape. It's also an L of one third. So the most important part is a sub-exponential algorithm where the uh, main exponent here is one-third. Now there are lots of ways to generalize this. I mean, when we're looking at fine fields, we don't just have prime fields. We're also having more general fields, so the Q could be some prime power. In particular, if you would be looking at fine fields over F2, those are well, nice for hardware engineering, for instance, and so They've gotten some attention for, for usage, not as much because fairly early we had seen some attacks, and I want to show you why the same ideas also work. This should help you to understand kind of the, the yeast behind why index calculus attacks work. So again, we need some structure where we can live from the, similar to like the integers mod p to the integers, and so we're looking at the representation of how our fine fields actually look like. Now, if you're looking at the binary field, then this f2 to the n is normally uh, represented as the polynomials over f2 modulo some morning irreducible polynomial. So if you're looking at 2 to the n, then this polynomial f there has degree n. And so then we can represent each element as the sum um, ci to the x, um, ci x to the i. And each ci is an f2. And so we have here a structure of polynomials modulo f, similar to what normally we have the integers, which is also ring, so polynomials over f2 are a ring, and the integers are a ring. And here we have polynomials over f2 mod f, and here we have the integers mod p. So there's a, a strong analogous structure there. And so here we're going to use our factor base to be, well, what corresponds to primes here, so irreducible polynomials of some bound and then, well, the steps work the same, but when we pick, well, our g is now also one of those polynomial representations, so we're considering g to the j, we do it modulo f, and then we forget about the f, and we look at this as a polynomial over f2, and we factor there. And then we can decide, does this polynomial split over the factor base or not? There's some bonus, because factorization over the integers is a bit slower than factorization over f2. Um, so factorization over 2 is polynomial time, much, much faster than uh, factorization over the integers. So all the sieving ideas carry over, and the factorization is somewhat faster. We have a good grasp of Smithson's ideas. And so Cobb Smith uh, fairly early on showed that the asymptotic cost, well, is also an L of one third, but the exponent, the C prime, was already known to be significantly smaller um, than for the number field set. Okay, so this one, because it is working in, well, functions, polynomials over F2, this is called the function field set. And also you're using, well, for the number field set, you're using extensions for the rational numbers. Here you're using extensions of F2 of X. And then if you're looking at more general fields, then if you have a small prime p large n, 
you're pretty much using adaptations of the function principle. So whether it's powers of two or powers of three, it works the same. So again, you would be doing polynomials over f3, you would be doing polynomials over f5, but at some point you're getting to some larger primes and smallish n's, and then it's better to use generalization of the number principle. So there's there's papers about like how you could cover this whole spectrum from well, number field sieve for the fp case to function field sieve on the f2 to the n case, and then where you should change from one to the other. Except for um, in the early 2010s, so 2012 to 2014, there was a lot of research um, on the very small prime case. And that has culminated in reaching something which is no longer just sub-exponential, but is actually quasi-polynomial. So binary fine fields or ternary fine fields are really not a no-go, uh, are now a no-go. So you must not use those for discrete log systems. If you're um, looking for other cases, there's also some progress in the medium prime size cases. So if you're looking for um, primes of, gosh, something like 200 bits and then some exponent there, those have gotten fast as well, but it's not as dramatic. And you're not looking at something which is um, quasi-polynomial. It's still sub-exponential, but there have been lots of improvements on the size. So if you're interested in a recent overview, uh, Rob Grange and Anton Ju have posted just uh, some weeks ago a nice one which is about discrete logs in general and covers fine fields in quite some detail.